Welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, a three-time award-winning show that aims to inspire and motivate you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media. We showcase the stories of incredible women who are making a difference in the world of adventure, exploration, and physical challenges. I'm your host, Sarah Williams, and I'm thrilled to have you here. If you're passionate about adventure, challenge, and learning from women who have overcome obstacles and achieved remarkable things, then this is the podcast for you. Every week, we bring you new episodes featuring incredible women who share their stories, insights, and tips to inspire and motivate you in tackling your own personal challenges. And the best part? By supporting the Tough Girl mission on Patreon, you're not just helping to keep the show going, you're joining a community of people who believe in the power of female role models to inspire and empower others. Your support helps us continue to bring you high quality content and promote the stories of amazing women around the world. Visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast to become a patron. New episodes every Tuesday at 7am UK time with occasional bonus episodes on a Thursday. Thank you for listening and for being a part of the Tough Girl community. Let's get started. My name is Alexandra Allred. Please call me Alex. That's what all my friends call me. Just growing up, I always loved the non-traditional female sports. That's not to say that the traditional female sports aren't that great, but I was always drawn to the non-traditional female sports and got into martial arts. I played women's professional football, but I guess my biggest segue into sports was bobsledding. And when I found out that women were not allowed to participate in the sport of bobsled, that changed the course of my life, literally. I had a non-traditional life as well. So by the time I was 18 years old, we lived in 20 places. My father was in military intelligence. And so I was born in Germany and we were all over the world. I have one sister who is very feminine. (laughs) And I think that probably, that's probably why I was the way I was. But I just, if I wasn't allowed to do it, I wanted to do it. And one of the jokes in my family growing up was, I was also very loud and I thought my mother was magical because she knew everything I was about to do before I did it. And only later did they tell me that my mom and dad are sitting in the living room on a couch and they can hear me say, and I'm going to take this umbrella and I'm going to jump off the roof and I'm going to try to land in that, you know, and then she'd come storming in the room and say, hand me that umbrella. You're not going to do anything like jump out of a tree or jump off the roof and leave. And I would think, wow, how did she know I was going to do that? But I would say growing up where I was always having to move to a different place, it was innate behavior, I think, that I felt like I always just had to insert myself into wherever, whatever. And so I was always trying to be the fastest, the strongest, kick the furthest, you know, that kind of thing. When I was 11, we were stationed in the then Soviet Union. We didn't have television. We didn't have movies. There was no such thing as video arcades or a shopping mall. And so with a small community, and all of us knew that we were always being followed, in, including kids, my days were spent by I'd get up, have my breakfast, and I'd go downstairs with my skateboard in the 70s. No one ever knew what a skateboard was in the Soviet Union. And I'd walk out of the tunnel and I would literally look around to figure out who was the KGB agent following me that day. And I would look around and tell that, okay, there he is right there. And then it was just in my mind, in my 11 year old mind, it was like, okay, game on. And I'd set down the board and away I'd go. And I just took great glee in knowing that this person was having to hustle after me. And I got quite good at the skateboard because <laughs> I'd weave through the you know, the traffic and people and down the stairs to the metro. And I really think that was where me becoming an adrenaline junkie, that's when it started. And there's not a lot of people that say that they out skateboarded KGB agents on a day-to-day basis, but that was <laughs> that was my 70s. That must have just been so funny for the KGB agents. It was just like, who's got the kid? No, I can't yeah. have the, not the, like, she's on a skateboard. Like, I, oh, no. They'll be having that That is so funny. Yeah. That's so funny you say that because my dad used to joke that there was an old TV show that always opened up with the police sergeant giving everybody their assignments and somebody would always get the bad assignment. And he used to always say they would be like, Igor, you got so-and-so and Boris, you got so-and-so and Vlad you got the kid. And then everybody would go, oh, poor Vlad. (laughs) (laughs) 
bobsleigh. Like, how did you even get exposed to that? Flash forward, I have a baby and I'm sitting on the couch watching ES- ESPN because I love sports and I see bo- bobsledding. I think this is absolutely the most cool sport I've ever seen. I mean, talk about adrenaline. And so I wait. I wait for the women. I want to see the the female competitors and they don't come. And this is, of course, before the Internet. So I wind up going to the library to find out where are the female bobsledders? Why didn't I see female bobsledders? And I learned that in 1940 in the United States, Catherine Dewey, who is the granddaughter of Melville Dewey of the Dewey Decimal, she is in an open competition and she wins. She wins the grand championship. It's the first time then and even to this date where the AAU had a female champion in an open competition. So she wins. It takes about two days for the men to all decide they really don't like this. She is stripped of her medal and women are banned from the sport of bobsled on the idea that it, the sleds are too heavy, the sport is too fast and far too dangerous for the fairer sex. <laughs> and when I read that, I was like, nope, this can't happen. And so I began writing a very long and obnoxious letter campaign drive against the International Olympic Committee, the United States Olympic Committee, the International Bobsled Federation. And it was about a month and a half later that I finally got a phone call basically saying, all right, we're going to have our first U.S. trials in Lake Placid, New York. Are you coming big mouth? And I always say, you know, wow, after all that trash talking, what do you do? You know, you have to say, yeah, I'll be there. And I hung up the phone and kind of looked around and thought, what have I done? I don't know anything about Bob's wedding. <laughs> and I kept making every cut, which was shocking to everybody because I was really sort of coming back together again after having my first child. And I just kept all through the winter and spring and into the summer. And that next fall, I won the U.S. Nationals and was the first ever U.S. bobsled champion. But the bigger news was that I was also over four months pregnant. I think that is the thing that generated most of the press for the bobsled team at that time. Thank you so much for obviously spotting the problem, doing your research and figuring out, oh, hold on, women ugh, women have been banned because some men got their feelings hurt because a woman won. And then actually doing something about it to drive home that that change. Because she was like, it's just even now, like I think in like 2023, you sort of forget that women weren't allowed to do many sports. Like I think you know, boxing only became legal for women in what, 2012 Olympics and running the marathon was like 1984 or something. And sorry, I've just gone off on a little bit of a tangent. I love it. Yeah, tell us more about the aftermath, especially with the press interest in, in terms of you being pregnant. Was that quite a lot of like sort of shock or did you get a lot of pushback in terms of, well, you shouldn't be allowed to do to do that when you are pregnant? You know, I love this topic so much and I'll sidetrack myself for a moment just to say, you know, one of the greatest unsung modern female athletes in our history is British boxer named Jane Couch. And Jane Couch, you know, we, you say female boxing and a lot of names come to mind and MMA fighters come to mind, but Jane Couch does not get her dues. And so I'm going to talk about her just for a moment if I can, because she actually fought in England. Women were not allowed to box. Um, and one of the main reasons was because we're too unstable because of our PMS. And she fought that. And that was a hard fight because, you know, when you look at the 1990s, we still weren't talking about, you want to talk about shock. You, you, uh, no proper female athlete would ever have a conversation about her menstrual cycle or PMS or her hormones. And Jane Couch took it on. I mean, she really, she's such a champion for women in sports. And because she's in such a non-traditional female sport, I feel like she's been all but forgotten. And so I try to bring her up as much as I can <laughs> um, because I, she's a phenomenal person. And, and so we as female athletes and lovers of women in sport, we need to recognize her more often. So that said, in the same time frame, yes, I definitely got a lot of pushback for being a pregnant female athlete. And it was another reason why I hung in. So 
when I found out that I was pregnant in the beginning of the summer, there was that first reaction of, oh my God, I can I, can I keep doing this? Two seconds later, my next thought was, yeah, but Alex, if you drop out, then that just feeds into the good old boy network of see, see, you can't, you can't let women do these kind of things because then they, they get in and they get pregnant and they drop out. That's our long storied history of women in the workforce, women in politics, women in sports. And so that was really the reason where I, I said, I'm staying in. And so instead of trying to hide it, I was very vocal about I'm pregnant, but I'm still doing this. Best thing I ever did for two reasons. One for the publicity to generate conversation, but someone at Case Western University heard about this lunatic woman who was squatting 375 pounds and I was clocked at running just under 20 miles an hour in sprint work and doing plyometrics. They'd never heard of an elite pregnant athlete doing this. And so they called and asked, would you be part of the study? And I said, you know, heck yes. And so I was literally hooked up to a heart monitor, a fetal monitor, EKG lead, leads, oxygen mask. And this is, you know, this is kind of squeamish, but also a rectal thermometer. <laughs> and the reason I did that was because we needed to know that my inner core temperature didn't get too high when I was doing more of this intensive training, especially the plyometrics. And to this day, too few OBGYNs understand that it's less about the heart rate of not going under 140 beats per minute as opposed to the inner core temperature. I mean, it's 2023. And people are still referring back to that study that I was in, in 1993 and 19, or I'm sorry, 1994. It lends to how little we pay attention to women in medicine. That And so I'm so happy that I was part of that. And I continuously push that. Okay, well, 140 beats per minute. Yeah, I'll watch that. But what's more important is your inner core temperature. I could stay at a steady, steady 142 beats per minute while my inner core temperature slowly rises and no one knows. So that was one of the best things. And so I, I stayed in for that reason. I, I had this, the Case Western University researchers behind me. I knew that my baby was safe. And so I pushed and pushed and I shared with other pregnant athletes. And then I had no idea that I was actually going to win the championship. I mean, I was just, I was sort of in my own world doing my own thing. And again, I get a good giggle out of the fact that we also know that when women are pregnant, the additional hormones that I have, it almost has a steroidal effect. So I really was just raging out when I was pushing that sled. And uh, that's how I won. I mean, I, I think that I had a, a whole team behind me. I knew that I was safe. I knew my baby was safe. And pregnant women are phenomenal human beings and athletes. It is incredible speaking to you because you have literally changed the landscape for not just elite athletes who are pregnant, but everyday normal women who are, you know, who want to stay fit and active during their during their pregnancies. But actually the research hasn't been done until you kick started it back in 1994. And you talked about your your team of people that you had around you. You know, did you have like mentors and, you know, how much support was there for you? Or did you sort of feel as though you were this in this this one one woman fight to try and drive this change? Regarding the pregnancy, there was no one. Even the doctors who were in the research with me, they kept saying to me, there is no one doing what you're doing. We women were always told you can't do that. And so women just simply did not because I kept asking, there would be times where I would say, okay, is this safe? Can I, I'm still hooked up and I'm looking at all my daughter, my daughter's vitals in utero. And, and I would say, is this, am I safe? Are we good here? And then they would say, well, your vitals are good. But then after they'd say, but you know, we're in uncharted territory right here. We don't, we don't know. So in terms of the pregnancy, there were no mentors except for the research team. They were vital to me doing this. I stayed in because the more I learned from the research, the more I knew that this was important to do. And I'll tell you one funny story, just flash forward. So I win nationals. I stay in the bobsled program. I eventually play women's professional football as an American football. 
did all these crazy things. And then as the internet really, really opened up and articles and things were starting to get published in the early 2000s, there'd be so many times where a woman would walk up to me and say, Oh, I read the article about you and that was so awesome. And thank you. I never knew. And I'd say, Oh, that's cool. What, what were you looking at? Because of all these things. And they'd say about the rectal thermometer. <laughs> and I would say, really? After everything I've done, this is how I'm going to make internet history is the, uh, she, and she wore the rectal thermometer. You know, it, it just kind of haunted me for a while, but now I'm proud of it. It has to be done. Like it's for science. It's for the research. Yeah. But you know, at the time it was just like, oh, okay. But and now in terms of mentors in sport, oh, I'm still very close to my fellow female bobsledders from 1994. We're, we're a little family. And because we, again, uncharted territory in terms of bobsledding. So I'll tell you this, and you said it so perfectly when you said, you know, it's 2023, it's hard to imagine that this is how it was barely 30 years ago. I, I teach kinesiology at a university. And so I tell my students all the time, look, I was an adult, even older than you are right now. And I remember, I, you know, so I won the U.S. championship. And as I'm bending over and the director of the U.S. Bobsled Federation at the time is putting the medal around my neck, he leans in. Sports Illustrated is there. They're taking pictures. And he leans in and he says to me, you know, this means nothing. And I went back. I, I was quiet. And we got back in the van and we went back. They took us, took us back to the Olympic Training Center. And we all gathered in my room. And I said, I told them all what happened. We talked about, well, look, we made a pact right there in the room that we were going to see it through until women were allowed to participate in the Olympic Games. Because and even when we made that pact, we had no idea of the storm that was coming. It was suggested, and um, you may know, but bobsledding is the most expensive winter sport, extremely expensive. And we were left to our own to fundraise, to get our own sled to get our own runners, um, which are, you know, between the sled and the runners, which are the blades on a bobsled, you're looking at half a million dollars. And we were left to ourselves to fundraise. And they suggested that we have a bake sale. And that was not by accident. They, that was they, any opportunity they got to slight us for being women and what a joke we were. And we were a joke initially because we had nothing. We had no money, no uniforms, no coaches barely given any training time. And how do you bobsled without a bobsled? And so it was easy for outsiders to see us as looking absolutely just chaotic. We were chickens with our heads cut off running around. But a few, too few knew that the bobsled federation was giving us nothing. So when we traveled on the World Cup, when we were in Calgary, it was the Jamaican and Tridian bobsled teams that helped us. And we're, I'm still really close with uh, Greg's son of, of um, Trinidad because they helped us. They taught us, you know, you, you have to learn how to crash even. If in, in a crash, know what to do so you're not just scrambled meat when you get down to the at the end of the mountain. So we were really left on our own, but ultimately, because we were badass women, we got a sponsor and we got $250,000 and we got, we finally got uniforms and we were sitting down in the Olympic training center cafeteria and a woman from the U S hockey team poked her head in the cafeteria. And she said, Hey, you, you should know they're rating your stuff upstairs. And we said, what? And they said, yeah, the men's B team, they're upstairs pilfering through all your new stuff that just came in. And so we went running upstairs. And the only reason that I have small feet and so, and a couple of others had smaller feet. The only reason that some of us got some of our equipment was because it was too small for the men that were pilfering through. We finally had to threaten to go to the press and to our sponsor before they made the men's B team give our stuff back to us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my yeah. God, this is like, how did you keep motivated during this? Because, I mean, the fact that that man said this means nothing. I mean, oh, my God, like that would be reframed, turned around. And to be honest, I can definitely see that as a motivator. Like, you know, I'll show you. I will prove to you. We will prove to you. But setback after setback, you know, 
try fundraising, sponsorship, just the microaggressions, the aggressions. You know, how did you keep your head held high and keep pushing on through? And obviously, like knowing the importance and knowing the goal, but you know, just the, the day-to-day challenges. That must have just been mentally and emotionally exhausting. It was, but and and I actually teach this in my kinesiology class to my male and female students. I say, and herein lies the power of women. I don't just mean female athletes. Women, we are so resilient and so strong in a way that men can't fathom. And here's how. Boys from the moment from, you know, growing up into men, they don't even understand the implicit and explicit bias that we hold against females. And so they do things and it's just their boys will be boys. Boys are doing boy things. But for girls at a very age, the most kind hearted, best, you know, well-intended person will walk up and laugh and say, oh, you shouldn't be playing with boys. You could get hurt. Well, you're a, you must be a tomboy. And so when a girl is playing in those non-traditional sports, well, then she's instantly given the name tag of tomboy boy, because if you're being strong or fast or aggressive, if you're being more competitive than what we see appropriate, then there's a, there, the boy tag is given to her. And, and so we go through life and then in life, we, we understand intuitively it will be our job to have children and our job to keep house and our job to keep peace and our job to mentor and nurture and make people feel better about themselves. And it'll be our job to change our bodies and it'll be our job to dress appropriately and our job not to cuss. And it's kind of our job to understand that we'll be paid less for the same and our job to understand that sometimes we won't get hired because we could potentially have a baby and then leave the job force. And that's our job. And so we t- we take on all of this without a thought. We just do. And so then when something happens in our lives, when we're older and stronger and more independent and we're given an opportunity like bobsledding, we look around at our fellow sisters and we all understand that we all understand. And I got a great story, which is, and I was not there. It was a, another American team and they were in St. Moritz. And just before the competition, the director of this, the Swiss bobsled team came in and said, ladies, and he told everyone to make sure to look good and put on lipstick. Now, remember, you're wearing a helmet for one thing. And I was told that literally around the room, as his words were translated to all the different nations, everyone just started quietly just shaking their heads and almost chuckling, laughing about it. And I pose to my male students all the time. I say, you guys can't imagine, but I would love for you to take a moment to imagine how many times male athletes will just go, you know what, piss on this and just walk out when they've hit their 10th obstacle, because they'll just move on to something else. But we're so conditioned to having obstacles of every kind of way, culturally, socially, economically, politically, um, that we, if we really want it, we're just going to rely on our sisters and we're going to, we're going to battle through. And that's the history in England. That's the history in India. That's the history here in the United States. I mean, that's just our history. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book is because women are just so much more badass than history and current media lets us believe. Yeah. Oh my God, like a thousand percent. And let's, you know, let's talk about the book. When Women Stood, The Untold History of Females Who Changed Sports and the World. Have you been dreaming about writing this book for a while? Because you just must have so many stories throughout, you know, the past 20, 30 years to, to, to pull on. Yes. And, and what's funny is I barely, I give a small mention to women in the, in the United States fighting to get into the bobsled program and the Olympics. But other than that, I barely touch on it because there's so much to women in sport. And, and so I thought about it for the longest time, but what really made me decide is I began more than a decade ago teaching kinesiology at the collegiate level. And I'd get these texts that were assigned to me by the college or university to teach from, right? And they're 300 page texts. 
about the entire history, yada, yada, yada. And usually I'd find about literally two or three pages about women's introduction into kinesiology, and that's it. And after a while, I started thinking, okay, my job here is to teach tomorrow's physical therapists, occupational therapists, coaches, trainers, sports broadcasters, sports journalists. How are they going to be any good when they don't know anything about literally half the world's population? That's when it really started. And so that's kind of where the book came from. And um, I'm not done. I'm writing a sequel because there's just so much information. So here in the United States, our top medical colleges and universities still use a 154 pound male to represent women in medicine. We still exclude uh, too many women from clinical trials. The pharmaceutical companies believe that because of our hormones, we're too time consuming and costly to um, fast research on medicines. And only 6% of all exercise science is given to women in sport. So we are so woefully neglected in medicine and sports science. We have to start talking about this now and start changing things because this is, it isn't just unfair. It's actually dangerous and negligent. One of the things that's happened recently is the, it, uh, the world athletics has decided to exclude transgender women who have gone through male puberty from female events. And I would just love to hear your, your thoughts on that. I did see that. I, you know, I, I saw that that just came out and then I waited a day or two to kind of watch, you know, the, all the feedback that comes. Cause I, I, I'm always interested in, in reading both sides. So for me personally, this is a no brainer. This is super easy. After three years of exhaustive research in which I read every study that I could get my hands on and I'm lucky in that because I am a professor in kinesiology, I can access a lot of studies that aren't in mainstream media. So I get to, I get to see everything that, that comes through. And after, um, research and I'm, forgive me this long answer, but I want your listeners to understand the research that went into this. After talking to biologists and anthropologists and, and doing all the, my own research and reading everything that's come out, it's easy to say, and, and I already said it to you, and that is, okay, here's where we stand. Cisgender females only have 6% of exercise science given to them. We know that medically, clinically, exercise science, kinesiology, she is woefully neg neglected. And the reason for that is because we say her hormones are a problem. There is a director at a top university in New Zealand who said that women are a bit of an anomaly. And so we just don't study them because they wreck our research. And so for that reason, we are going to pretend that her hormones, her menstrual cycle, her pregnancy and menopause, it, it doesn't matter. And that, that's not, I'm not being dramatic. That's actually what we see. It just doesn't matter in terms of putting out a final product in medicine and such. And along that line in 2014, the IOC said, um, transgender females in sport. Yeah, sure. And of course they did because nobody was paying attention to the cisgender female body. So my answer to you, the question of, is it fair? We don't even have to talk about, is it fair in terms of transgender female athletes? Let's first have a conversation about the space that is the cisgender female space. When we get 50%, just 50%, I, I'm not asking 100, 50% in medical trials, in medicine, in exercise science, and how does her hormones affect her pre and post athletic event? How does it affect her during? What's the deal with the cramping and how does a menstrual cycle affect headaches, migraines, sleeplessness, emotional ups and downs, hormonal turns? How does it affect bloating? And then also just her, her diet, her weight, how she performs as an athlete, how she recovers from an athlete. Let us have 50% of those studies focusing on not testosterone, but actual female hormones first. Let's just get that done. And then we can open up the conversation of letting 
a non non female biological body into the into the fray. And I mean, that's just science. That's that's fact. And I I speak to my uh, transgender female athlete students as well. And I I say in every class and this is personal to me because my um, I have a family member who fully transitioned and I talked to her before I began writing about this. If we were talking about her being a police officer, a lawyer, a chess master, a bricklayer, it doesn't matter. Anything in the world, it doesn't matter. All people should be able to live the life that they are meant to be. And I fully embrace that. And And I saw when she did not transition, how unhappy she was. And now that she's female, she's she's so happy and, she, and she's so fully engaged. So in all realms of life, everybody should be who they should be. But in this small area that has been so neglected by politicians and med and, and medicine and, and everything, we need to make sure that we fully understand how the female hormones work as an athlete and stop the Mary Kane stories from happening again. Stop the Dr. Stacy Sims stories from ever happening again in competition. Make sure that we understand her body and then we can say, okay, now let's, let's turn and let's talk about testosterone levels. And more than that, also, we do need to consider that skeletally, they're two different bodies. I do think though, right now, it is imperative that there, a space is created for transgender athletes because of the suicide and the depression and just my God, the way the world has turned them into villains for wanting to be in sports is also so dangerous. And so we need to have a space for transgender athletes as well, especially our youth and have programs set up for mentoring them and, and counseling them and helping them transition healthily and, and be happy. And we need to educate all people around the world about who they are. They're, you know, let me just say, uh, one of the things in my book is people don't wake up one day and say, I believe I will be the opposite sex. They're not doing that. This is throughout history, back to the Egyptian times, we know that there were transgender men and women. So there is something here. We need to know more about that too. But right now, we need to pump the brakes on having transgender female athletes in women's sports because it's not time. It's not fair. And we need to do due diligence. What are the Mary Kane and the Dr. Stacey Sims stories? So Dr. Um, Stacey Sims is, um, she lives in New Zealand and she was an iron woman athlete and she goes to the Iron Man in Hawaii, and she is uh, a, she's a phenomenal athlete, and she knows she's going to do well. The end of the story is she absolutely tanks and winds up in the medical tent, and and is really struggling. And she's looking around at fellow athletes, and she's what happened? She's bewildered. How how did I how did I tank so miserably? Why what happened to me? The end of the story is it was other female athletes who said, "Well, when are you supposed to start your period?" And they they give her a fast education on her menstrual cycle and how that is absolutely 100% tied to how she powered down in her event. And so she says, she goes back and she talks to the director of this university in, in New Zealand. And he's the one that says, yeah, we really don't, we don't study females because they're just, you know, your hormones make you too erratic. It's too hard for us to track you. And, and so it's just, it's easier just not. That's what got her in. And now she's, and I, and I hope your listeners will go find her on YouTube because she gives lectures on YouTube, Dr. Stacy Sims, S-I-M-S. And she is fantastic. I love her. Um, and I, and I did get to speak to her for, for this book. We have actually had Dr. Stacy Sims on, on the podcast before, but I was just, I was just wanting to know what, what the story, what the story was in case I, I'd missed something. But yeah, she's got an, an amazing book, amazing TED talk. You know, women are not small men and should not you know, train like men and actually have, exactly. Yeah. Incredible knowledge. Well, and going into the women are not small men. That's the Mary Kane story. Mary Kane is dubbed the fastest girl in, in America. Nike swoops her up. She's Olympic bound. Her dreams are coming true. She's a phenomenal athlete, unstoppable, unbeatable. And then she gets a full male staff who have no idea 
how the female hormones work. And so they arbitrarily give her a weight that they think that she should have. They don't understand the, her fat content. They don't understand her hip structures. They don't understand the female triad. They don't understand the nutritional needs of a female athlete. And so they literally starve her to death and she attempts suicide and they destroy her. And only after she leaves and starts talking about it, does Nike come under the microscope and they do eventually fire these guys and Nike says, okay, we're going to do better. And that does start the conversation about women are not small men, but you know, this is my talking point all the time is, so we can all say that women are not small men and we all nod our heads and agree with that. But you know what, according to medicine and according to the IOC and according to you know, still talking about the transgender female testosterones as opposed to the female hormones in the space of women's sports, the world clearly thinks women are still small men. And that, you know, it's just so dangerous. And in the United States, uh, women in, in all Western countries, more women die during childbirth in the United States than any other Westernized country. Why? Well, we don't really take women seriously in our study of medicine. Yeah. Oh, it's, they're heavy topics. Yeah. I promise the book actually has some really fun, funny stories too. <laughs> these are the, these are the heavy topics that just make, it's just the world has made being a female athlete so much harder than it should be. Why can't she just play? And that was a, an NBA player once said, I feel sorry for the female athlete because when I want to play, I just put on my shoes and I play. When a female athlete wants to play, she has to do so many things before she can. Yeah. I just love to know your, your thoughts, especially over the past sort of 30 years and how media has changed with, with the internet, et cetera. From your viewpoint, do you think the media coverage for women is, is improving? Is it getting better? Yes. That is a great question. It is getting better, but there's always a but when we talk about women. And in my book, and I won't go, it's just too much, but in my book, I, I do actually talk about the history of cosmetic surgery and the si the sizing of women's clothing and how different the sizing of, of clothing is in the women's industry and the men's industry, why women's clothing, the exact same kind of clothing costs more for women than men. So, you know, it is, and it's all centered around media and how the world sees women. So they're, they're, they're big topics that I, I do take on in a historical way in the book. But the simple answer to you is, you know, it is getting better because we have more and more women like you, like this podcast, you saw the need and you want to push the boundaries a little bit. I mean, cause you could have, you could have had a, a podcast called pretty girls, <laughs> which I'm sure there is already one, but instead you really did the, the non-traditional female route of, of tough girls, which I love. And so podcasts like this are bringing these kind of stories to light. So it is, it's getting better. But we are in a dual world right now where we still, we have, we expect female athletes to look a certain way. And that's why, you know, in 2020, there was the big Olympic scandal with the Norwegian volleyball team and they actually wanted to put on more clothing. And so they were penalized because they wanted to maybe have on more clothing than the traditional bikini that they have to wear. And there's constant stuff. The sexualization of women's uniforms is, is a continued issue. But I think as women are starting to talk more and more about pregnancy, menopause, their menstrual cycle in sport, as they're talking about um, less makeup and more clothing, we're getting seen in a more positive way. I mean, there's always going to be the pushback because we want to have that, that hegemonic feminine ideal look. But, um, you know, we're getting there and it is getting better. And so I, that's what I, I focused on is we've, we have to support each other and really just focus on just, it's less about what she looks like and it's more about what she can do. I do see us heading in that direction. We're never going to fully abandon it because of fashion magazines and the media, but we're getting there and I, and I love it. And, and I'm seeing more and more strong outspoken women who care less and less about the pretty and more and more about the, how strong I am. And I'll end it by saying, so at the end of one session in my college course, I was talking about the Latina female athlete. And I said, you know, 
most people are surprised that the Latina and the Indian and the and the Muslim female athletes they really didn't make their appearance until the 1990s or the late 1990s. And one of my students raised his hand and he said, well, they're all really hypersexualized and it's hard to take someone seriously when she's hypersexualized. And there was a moment I just kind of nodded and the whole class, you could have heard a pin drop because everyone realized the truth and the power of that statement is the more our women turn toward um, breast, you know, enhancements and, and we, we want to have, we want to look like little twigs on stilts with Babumi outfits. It's really hard to take that person seriously. And so is that her fault? No, I mean, it's, this is, it's society's fault for, for embracing that image. But the downside that everyone has to pay attention to is it's hard to get respect when that's an image, a hypersexualized image is hard to respect. Yeah. So yeah, that's what he, you know, that's why I, I remind my female students of that all the time is just be you. Stop worrying about everything else in the image of you. Just be you. Yeah. And Alex, where's the best place for people to connect with you, to buy your book, to follow along with your work? Where should they go? Thank you for asking. I've got a website and it's pretty simple. It's www.alexandra allred.com. It's just my name. Yep. What can women do who want to help to continue to drive this change? What are the practical steps that they can take to support and encourage other women in this sports world? Wow. I love that question too, because the reason that the title is Females Who Change Sport and the World is because just like male athletes, sports isn't just sports. I mean, the politics, cultural attitudes, society and economy are all wrapped up in sports. You know, I tell women all the time is support female athletes for sure, support female athletes. But the bigger than that is just supporting women. It historically speaking, the idea of, you know, we've always heard men can fight, they get over it, and then they're friends again. But you, you know how women can be. Oh, you know how women can be when they're in a group. That's actually incorrect. Anthropologically speaking, um, in history, we have been our greatest champions. And it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that during that period that we started to sell the idea that women turn on women. We've never been that way throughout history. We've been taught to believe that. Instinctively, we are our, our greatest champions and we are sisters. And so let's dial back to what who we have always been and just don't get in conversations in which you're bashing another woman because of how she looks. Support your sisters. And because when we start supporting ourselves and standing up for ourselves, we can stop the momentum that is taking place in the world right now of taking away women's rights. And it's happening right now that women are losing rights of her own body. She's losing rights to vote. She's losing rights to drive again in some parts of the world. The world is rolling back on us and we cannot sit back and watch. We just have to speak up in support of each other constantly and remind our sons and our brothers and our fathers that we are fully strong and capable and smart and we can make the world better. And we, we have and we will and, we, and that's who we are. Alex, thank you so much for finishing the podcast with those incredible words of wisdom and advice. Just phenomenal to speak to you. And thank you so much for sharing what you've shared. It's incredible what you've done for women around the world and for women in sports. And yeah, thank you for just being an incredible role model. Thank you for giving, it sounds corny, but thank you for giving all of us a platform to talk, you know, to talk on these topics. You're, you're wonderful. Thank you. Hey Tribe, we are celebrating the eight year anniversary of the Tough Girl podcast today, the 4th of August 2023. And to do that, there are four episodes being released today, one at 7am, 11am, 3pm and 7pm. There are going to be nine episodes going live throughout the month of August. I do just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who has been listening and supporting the work of the Tough Girl podcast. Without the patrons and the financial support, the Tough Girl podcast would not be around today and these stories would not be shared. Thank you to all of the incredible patrons 
friends, you know who you are. If you've been listening for a while and want to support the work, you can make a one-off donation via PayPal or you can sign up as an annual or monthly patron via Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast. I'm delighted to share that the next episode will be going live on the 8th of August at 7am UK time with Dr. Catherine Bishop. She is a triple Olympian, rowing world champion and Olympic silver medalist. She is also the author of The Long Win, The Search for a Better Way to Succeed. So Kath draws on her careers as an Olympic rower and a conflict diplomat, combining with her experiences of working with a wide range of organizations across sectors to raise performance, transform cultures and develop effective leaderships and teams. As an Olympic rower, Kath competed at three Olympic Games. Highlights include winning the World Championship in 2003 and an Olympic silver medal in 2004. As a diplomat for over a decade, Kath specialised in conflict issues with postings to Bosnia and Iraq, as well as leading in Whitehall on the UK civilian contribution to stabilising conflicts around the world. These experience equips her with leadership, negotiation skills, resilience, and the ability to deliver outstanding performance under extremely challenging circumstances. Kath has published The Long Win, The Search for a Better Way to Succeed, that challenges the often narrow lens we have on what winning means and sets out a new way of thinking and reframing success across business, sport, and education. This is an episode well worth listening to, as are all of the Tough Girl podcast episodes. There are now over 650 episodes in the back catalogue, which is epic. Please do tell one friend about the Tough Girl podcast, share the joy, share the stories, and you could change someone's life. So many women reach out to me and tell me about the adventures and challenges they have done after listening to the women on the Tough Girl podcast, which is what it is all about, motivating and inspiring you. Thank you so much for being on this journey with me. And all that's left for me to say is, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, Give it your all. Give it 110%. Get after it. Go for it. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care. Lots of love and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.